Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 163. Today's big Bible question is, who are the two witnesses of Revelation? So hello, friends. Happy Tuesday to you. As you all may remember, we on this podcast are following the Bible reading plan devised by our old friend Robert Murray McShane of Dundee, Scotland, a mighty young man of God who died in the 1800s. I love his Bible reading plan, but every now and then I have some questions about it. Questions I suppose I'll have to wait until eternity to have an answer to. For instance, today's question would be seven chapters? That seems like a high number, Brother McShane. I know some of those Psalms chapters are short, but reading seven chapters in a day seems like a lot. But you know what? I'm not complaining. The more the merrier when it comes to the Bible I'm just pointing out that seven is a new record for chapters read for us in a day. Speaking of those seven, they are Deuteronomy 13 and 14, Psalms 99, 100, and 101, Isaiah 41, and Revelation chapter 11. In Revelation 11, we are introduced to two more mysterious figures in that book. I'm not sure you've noticed, but Revelation is packed with more mysterious figures per page than an Agatha Christie novel or an Arthur Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes novelette. Today's mysterious figures seem to stand out above the rest, too, at least in terms of how debated their identities are. Here's how they're introduced in Revelation 11, 4 4 through 6. I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for 1,260 days dressed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. They have authority to close up the sky so that it does not rain during the days of their prophecy. They also have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague whenever they want. Unfortunately for us, and for those who would seek to deduce the identity of the two witnesses here, they are not introduced with a lot of background or detail. Much like Elijah's introduction in 1 Kings, they are just all of a sudden on the scene and prophesying. Who are they? What do they do? Why does the earth hold a sort of faux Christmas party around the globe when they are killed? That sounds morbid. Well, let's read the chapter and find out. Revelation chapter 11 verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. Then I was given a measuring reed like a rod with these words, Go and measure the temple of God in the altar and count those who worship there, but exclude the courtyard outside the temple. Don't measure it because it is given to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for 1,260 days dressed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. They have authority to close up the sky so that it does not rain during the days of their prophecy. They also have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague whenever they want. When they finish their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war on them, conquer them, and kill them. Their dead bodies will lie in the main street of the great city, which figuratively is called Sodom in Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. And some of the peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will view their bodies for three and a half days and not permit their bodies to be put into a tomb. Those who live on the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and send gifts to one another because these two prophets had tormented those who lived on the earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet. Great fear filled those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. They went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched them. At that moment, a violent earthquake took place, and a tenth of the city fell, and 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Take note, the third woe is coming soon. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, 
and he will reign forever and ever. The 24 elders who were seated before God on their thrones fell face down and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, Lord God the Almighty, who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, but your wrath has come. The time has come for the dead to be judged and to give the reward to your servants, the prophets, to the saints, and to those who fear your name, both small and great. And the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, an earthquake, and severe hail. Mercy. Okay, so maybe now we have more questions than answers. Welcome to the book of Revelation. The two witnesses are indeed fascinating figures. They prophesy in sackcloth for approximately three and a half years, and we need to remember here that a year was considered 360 days when the New Testament was written. These witnesses can spew fire out of their mouths at their enemies. They have the power to make it stop raining, and they have the power to turn the water to blood and strike the waters and the land with plagues whenever they want to. After three and a half years, when they finish their testimony, a beast will come out of the abyss and wage war on them, killing them in Jerusalem, and their bodies will just be displayed laying there where they died for like three and a half days, and nobody's going to bury them. In fact, the people around the earth who, for whatever reason, are utterly fed up with the two witnesses, they're going to gloat. They're going to celebrate. They're going to have parties and send gifts to each other because these two guys have been killed by the beast. But after three and a half days, God will resurrect them and they will be called up to heaven while their enemies are gawking and watching in amazement. And then as that's happening, a great earthquake is going to shake the city of Jerusalem and kill 7,000 people and destroy a tenth of the city. Now, you probably can see by now why Revelation was one of my favorite Bible books as a youngling. Never a dull moment in the whole thing. Now, I sure didn't understand it then. Don't know that I do now, but boy, oh boy, was it exciting. So how literal should we take the book of Revelation? That's actually really a great question. There is obviously a great amount of figurative language in the books, as evidenced even in this chapter very obviously in verse 8, when John tells us that the city where the witnesses die is figuratively called Sodom in Egypt, but is obviously Jerusalem. To be frank, I believe Part of Revelation is figurative and symbolic in some way, and part is literal. And honestly, I just rarely know exactly where to draw that line. I do believe, though, if I have to speculate, that the two witnesses spoken of here are literally two people who will come in the future, and um, they're going to do what the Bible says they're going to do. So that gets us back to our big question of the day. Who are they? Guesses about this have abounded for years, and I mean pretty much ever since the first century. The early church leaders and fathers have been discussing the identity of these two guys. Moses, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, Elijah, Enoch, etc. Even the church and the testaments of the Bible. Well, fortunately, we have some clues in the passage. Are they going to help us solve the mystery? Well, we'll see. Because the problem with the clues are they're kind of vague and they're difficult to interpret rightly, but they are clues nonetheless. And our first clue comes in verse 4, and it's obviously intended to be a clue, which verse 4 says, These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now, it's like John is saying, look, I'm going to tell you at least a little bit about who these guys are. Now, there are three chapters in the Bible that mention olive oil or trees and lampstands in the same place. Exodus 27.20 tells us that the lampstand in the tabernacle is to be an oil burning lampstand that should be fueled by olive oil. I think that's probably a clue of some sort, very much a symbolic clue. Zechariah chapter 4, however, in the Old Testament gives us even more illumination. For verses 1 through 3 says, The angel who was speaking with me then returned and roused me as one wakened out of a sleep. 
He asked me, what do you see? I replied, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top. The lampstand also has seven lamps at the top with seven spouts for each of the lamps. There are also two olive trees beside it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. So there we go. We got a lampstand and we got the two olive trees exactly like Revelation 11. And we go to verse 11 of Zechariah 4 through 14. And Zechariah asks the angel, what are the two olive trees on the right and left of the lampstand? And I questioned him further. What are the two streams of the olive trees from which the golden oil is pouring through the two golden conduits? Then he inquired of me, don't you know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. Verse 14, these are the two anointed ones, he said, who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Well, very obviously, Revelation 11 is referring back to Zechariah 4, because the two witnesses in Revelation 11 are depicted as the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. That's in Revelation 11, 4. There's no doubt there's a parallel between Zechariah 4 and Revelation 11, 4. Great, mystery solved, right? Eh, no, not even close. We haven't solved anything yet, but maybe we're sort of on track. The game is afoot. It appears, maybe, that the two anointed ones that Zechariah 4 is discussing is probably Joshua, son of Yehutzadak, and Zerubbabel. Now, Joshua was a high priest at the time of the book of Zechariah, and Zerubbabel was a governmental leader. And both of these guys led the people in the rebuilding of the temple after the Jewish exile to Babylon. I should also note that Joshua, the high priest, or Yeshua, as he would have been known in Hebrew, has the exact same Hebrew name as Jesus, or Yeshua, as he would be known known in Hebrew. And maybe this is significant. Now, there's a couple of other clues here. Uh, For one, there's the fire-breathing thing. I'm not sure how big of a clue that is. There is passage in Psalms and a passage in, I think it's 2 Samuel, that talks about God breathing fire. There's a passage in, oh goodness, uh, Jeremiah or Ezekiel, where God says, I will cause my word to come out of your mouth like a fire. Uh, And so I sort of think that could be what's talked about here, but that doesn't give us a big clue. But Revelation 11.6 probably does give us some clues when it says, they, the two witnesses, have authority to close up the sky so that it does not rain during the days of their prophecy. They also have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague whenever they want. Well, closing up the sky so that it doesn't rain sure seems reminiscent of Elijah, the prophet in the Old Testament, and plagues in turning water to blood absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt reminds one of Moses. Surely this is an intentional clue also, and it's one of the reasons why many people today think that the two witnesses will be Moses and Elijah. Now, another point in favor of that view is the transfiguration in which Jesus met with Moses and Elijah while he was on earth, while he was transfigured. Now, probably the leading theory as to the identity of these two witnesses is indeed Moses and Elijah, but maybe the second most prevalent theory as of today in the church is Elijah and Enoch. And we can turn to Michael Hoodman of gotquestions.org to explain the reasonings behind those two guys. And he says, Enoch and Elijah are seen as possibilities for the two witnesses because of the unique circumstances surrounding their exit from the world. Enoch and Elijah, as far as we know, are the only two individuals whom God has taken directly to heaven without experiencing death. Proponents of this view point to Hebrews 9.27, which says that all men are appointed to die once. The fact that neither Enoch nor Elijah has yet experienced death seems to qualify them for the job of the two witnesses who will be killed when their job is done. In addition, both Enoch and Elijah were prophets who pronounced the judgment of God. Well, there's a pretty good case to be made for that. The early church father uh, from North Africa named Augustine, who was in the 300s and the 400s, he favored the Elijah-Enoch solution. But there are actually other theories as well. 
Promasius, a bishop of the church in the 500s, Ecumenius, also from the 500s, and the theologian Tychonius from the 300s, all believe that the two witnesses refer to the church and the two testimonies of the Bible. For instance, they wrote, These are the those who stand, not those who shall stand as though they were not able to stand. In the two lampstands, he signifies the church, which is fortified by the protection of the two testaments. Also, they wrote, While he had said, You must prophesy again, here it is that I will grant to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy. There he spoke of John, here of the two witnesses, that is, of the church that preaches and prophesies on the basis of the two testaments. Tychonius said the two witnesses symbolize the two testaments by which God governs and rules his church. Ecumenius said the two witnesses are said to be two olive trees and two lampstands, For they represent the one church, which is formed from the two peoples of the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, Caesarius of Arles, a bishop of the 400s and 500s, also believed very similarly to the other guys. And he said, were anyone to harm the church, the prayers of the church would consume them, either that they might be corrected or they might be punished. So what he's saying there is, that the fire coming out of the mouth of the two witnesses is not necessarily literal fire, but it's God's answering the prayer of the church as they represent the two witnesses in the earth. Now, in contrast, Victorinus, who was writing in the late 200s, actually had a pretty out there theory. He thought it would be Jeremiah and Elijah. He said, it will be Jeremiah who, along with Elijah, returns to announce the Lord's coming. Well, what do I think? Uh, it doesn't matter, obviously. Um, I have uh, no significant perspective to add to this, but I'll give you my take on it. Uh, take it for what it's worth, which is exactly what you paid for this podcast. Ultimately, I believe that the two witnesses will not be Moses and Elijah, or the church and the commandments, or Elijah and Enoch, or Joshua and Zerubbabel, or even Jeremiah. This is due to the fact that 11, Revelation 11 very clearly refers to multiple scriptures in giving us clues to the identity of the two witnesses, which lead to more than two people. In other words, some of the clues point to Joshua and Zerubbabel. Some of the clues point to Moses and Elijah. And I believe this is intentional. John is telling us that neither of these pairs will literally be the two witnesses, but the two witnesses will be like those people. I believe it's likely then that the two witnesses will kind of come on the scene in a very similar way as John the Baptist. It'll be like a John the Baptist situation. JTB came in the spirit and power of Elijah, says Jesus, but he himself was not literally Elijah. I think the two witnesses could come in the spirit and power of Moses and Elijah, etc., but not be literal incarnations of those two people. Now, it's also worth noting as a further clue that Moses and Zerubbabel were both political leaders of the people, and Elijah and Joshua the high priest were both religious leaders of the people. This might be inconsequential coincidence, but it also could be a significant clue, and I think it is. And I think it think it points to the possibility that one of the witnesses of Revelation could be a civil leader, and one could be a spiritual leader. And could it even be possible that they're involved in the reconstruction of the temple in Israel, much like Joshua and Zerubbabel were? Well, I don't know. We haven't fully solved the mystery, but considering this is one of the most enduring mysteries of Christendom, I suppose it's arrogance to think we could fully solve it on this one podcast. Well, I hope that was an interesting discussion for you. This is one of the times I really would love to hear your take. Who do you think the witnesses are? One way to leave feedback is to go to our website, BibleReadingPodcast.com. That's BibleReadingPodcast.com. And you can leave us a comment there. You can leave it on this episode. Heck, you can leave it on any episode. I'll pick it up. It's not like the uh, podcast blog is just covered up with a comment. So leave a comment. Tell me what you think. Who do you think are the two witnesses of Revelation? I'd love to know. Um, and with that, let's keep on reading. 
we will go to Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1. If a prophet or someone who has dreams arises among you and proclaims a sign or wonder to you, and that sign or wonder he has promised you comes about, but he says, let's follow other gods which you have not known and let's worship them, do not listen to that prophet's words or to that dreamer. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You must follow the Lord your God and fear him. You must keep his commands and listen to him. You must worship him and remain faithful to him. That prophet or dreamer must be put to death because he has urged rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the place of slavery to turn you from the way the Lord your God has commanded you to walk. You must purge the evil from you. If your brother, the son of your mother, or your son or daughter, or the wife you embrace, or your closest friend secretly entices you, saying, Let's go worship other gods, which neither you nor your ancestors have known, any of the gods of the peoples around you, near you or far from you, from one end of the earth to the other, do not yield to him or listen to him. Show him no pity and do not spare him or shield him. Instead, you must kill him. Your hand is to be the first against him to put him to death, and then the hands of all the people." Stone him to death for trying to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. All Israel will hear and be afraid, and they will no longer do anything evil like this among you. If you hear it said about one of your cities, the Lord your God is giving you to live in, that wicked men have sprung up among you, led the inhabitants of the city astray, and said, Let's go and worship other gods which you have not known. You are to inquire, investigate, and interrogate thoroughly. If the report turns out to be true that this detestable act has been done among you, you must strike down the inhabitants of that city with your sword, completely destroy everyone in it, as well as its livestock with the sword. You are to gather all its spoil in the middle of the city square and completely burn the city and all its spoil for the Lord your God. The city is to remain a mound of ruins forever. It is not to be rebuilt. Nothing set apart for destruction is to remain in your hand so that the Lord will turn from his burning anger and grant you mercy, show you compassion, and multiply you as he swore to your ancestors. This will occur if you obey the Lord your God, keeping all his commands I am giving you today, doing what is right in the sight of the Lord your God. Chapter 14, verse 1. You are the sons of the Lord your God. Do not cut yourself or make a bald spot on your head on behalf of the dead. For you are a holy people belonging to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be his own possession out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. You must not eat any detestable thing. These are the animals you may eat. Oxen, sheep, goats, deer, gazelles, roe, deer, wild goats, ibexes, antelopes, and mountain sheep. You may eat any animal that has hooves divided in two and chews the cud. But among the ones that chew the cud or have divided hooves, you are not to eat these. Camels, hares, and hyraxes. Though they chew the cud, they do not have hoofs. They are unclean for you. And pigs, though they have hooves, they do not chew the cud. They are unclean for you. Do not eat their meat or touch their carcasses. You may eat everything from the water that has fins and scales, but you may not eat anything that does not have fins and scales. It is unclean for you. You may eat every clean bird, but these are the ones you may not eat. Eagles, bearded vultures, black vultures, the kites, any kind of falcon, any kind of raven, ostriches, short-haired owls, short-eared owls, gulls, any kind of hawk, little owls, long-eared owls, barn owls, eagle owls, ospreys, cormorants, storks, any kind of heron, hoopoes, and bats. All winged insects are unclean for you. They may not be eaten, but you may eat every clean flying creature. You are not to eat any carcass. You may give it to a resident alien within your city gates, and he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner. For you are a holy people belonging to the Lord your God. Do not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Each year you are to set aside a tenth of all that you produce, all the produce grown in your field. You are to eat a tenth of your grain, new wine, and fresh oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to have his name dwell, so that you will always learn to fear the Lord your God. But if the distance is too great for you to carry it, since the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far away from you, and since the Lord your God has blessed you, then exchange it for silver. Take the silver in your hand and go to the place the Lord your God chooses. You may spend the silver on anything you want, cattle, sheep, goats, wine, beer, or anything you desire. You are to feast there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice with your family. Do not neglect the Levite within your city gates, since he has no portion or inheritance among you. 
At the end of every three years, bring a tenth of all your produce for that year and store it within your city gates. Then the Levite, who has no portion or inheritance among you, the resident alien, the fatherless, and the widow within your city gates may come eat and be satisfied. And the Lord your God will bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. Psalm chapter 99. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awe-inspiring name. He is holy. The mighty king loves justice. You have established fairness. You have administered justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those calling on his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them in a pillar of cloud. They kept his decrees and the statutes he gave them. Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their sinful actions. Exalt the Lord, our God. Bow and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord, our God, is faithful. Psalm chapter 100. Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his, his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. Psalm chapter 101. I will sing of faithful love and justice. I will sing praise to you, Lord. I will pay attention to the way of integrity. When will you come to me? I will live with a heart of integrity in my house. I will not let anything worthless guide me. I hate the practice of transgression. It will not cling to me. A devious heart will be far from me. I will not be involved with evil. I will destroy anyone who secretly slanders his neighbor. I cannot tolerate anyone who, with haughty eyes or an arrogant heart. My eyes favor the faithful of the land so that they may sit down with me. The one who follows the way of integrity may serve me. No one who acts deceitfully will live in my palace. The one who tells lies will not be retained here to guide me. Every morning I will destroy all the wicked of the land, wiping out all evildoers from the Lord's city. Isaiah 41, verse 1. Be silent before me, coasts and islands, and let peoples renew their strength. Let them approach, let them testify. Let's come together for the trial. Who has stirred up someone from the east? In righteousness, he calls him to serve. The Lord hands nations over to him and he subdues kings. He makes them like dust with his sword, like wind-driven stubble with his bow. He pursues them, going on safely, hardly touching the path with his feet. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning I am the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. The coasts and islands see and are afraid. The whole earth trembles. They approach and arrive. Each one helps the other and says to another, take courage. The craftsman encourages the metal worker. The one who flattens with the hammer encourages the one who strikes the anvil, saying of the soldering, it is good. He fastens it with nails so that it will not fall over. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend, I brought you from the ends of the earth and called you from its farthest corners. I said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you. I haven't rejected you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. Be sure that all who are enraged against you will be disgraced. Those who contend with you will become as nothing and will perish. You will look for those who contend with you, but you will not find them. Those who war against you will become absolutely nothing. For I am the Lord your God, who holds your right hand, who says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Do not fear, you worm, Jacob, you men of Israel, I will help you. This is the Lord's declaration. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. See, I will make you into a sharp threshing board, new with many teeth. You will thresh mountains and pulverize them and make hills into chaff. You will winnow them and a wind will carry them away. A whirlwind will scatter them, but you will rejoice in the Lord and you will boast in the Holy One of Israel. The poor and the needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst. I will answer them. I am the Lord, the God of Israel. I will not abandon them. 
I will open rivers on the barren heights and springs in the middle of the plains. I will turn the desert into a pool and dry land into springs. I will plant cedar, acacia, myrtle, and olive trees in the wilderness. I will plant juniper, elm, and cypress trees together in the desert so that all may see and know. Consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. Submit your case, says the Lord. Present your arguments, says Jacob's king. Let them come and tell us what will happen. Tell us the past events so that we may reflect on them and know the outcome. Or tell us the future. Tell us the coming events that we will know that you are gods. Indeed, do something good or bad. Then we will be in awe when we see it. Look, you are nothing, and your work is worthless. Anyone who chooses you is detestable. I have stirred up one from the north, and he has come, and one from the east who invokes my name. He will march over rulers as if they were mud, like a potter who treads the clay. Who told about this from the beginning so that we might know, and from times past so that we might say he is right? No one announced it, no one told it, no one heard your words." I was the first to say to Zion, look, here they are, and I gave Jerusalem a herald with good news. When I look, there is no one, there is no counselor among them. When I ask them, they have nothing to say. Look, all of them are a delusion. Their works are non-existent, their images are wind and emptiness. Well, my friends, let me close again reading the words of verse 10, Isaiah 41, verse 10 Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. Blessed be his name. Thank you, God, for that promise. May the Lord bless you, dear friends. Godspeed.